Okay, I don't have much to say at this point because I'm so over it, but um, it is happening tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Thank you to Denton ISD who gave us test booklets to use because I never got my box. Um, but it'll be all 10th graders and then um, the 9th graders that have already registered on 11th. They all know who they are. Um, everything has been communicated. And so the only thing I ask is if you were on the proctor list, then I sent a, an, an email to you. So if you have heard nothing about being a proctor, then you're not a proctor. Um, and I went and visited with all those people today, so they all know who they are for sure. Okay, so just make sure you make your time um, if you are a proctor, and then we will get this done and over with tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Any questions? Okay, that's all I got for you. Um, it's the value of your time. I'm going to try to get through the agenda fairly quickly. Um, by the way, one of the things I did notice at the beginning of the meeting was how many of you came up here to sign the sign-in sheet, which we didn't have a sign-in sheet today. And I'm going to use that to talk a little bit about one of the ways to reduce your grading time. Some of you know this technique, some of you might not. But if you're, especially if you're a math teacher or maybe even a physics teacher who gives a lot of homework, sometimes you don't have to grade all of it. I have worked at times where I would walk in and say, I need the homework from this row, or I need the homework from this group sideways. That's if you have your kid in rows. If you don't have your kids in rows, you can say, I need the homework from those two tables. Or you can say, I need the homework from this diagonal. Now, the only thing you have to be careful of is to make sure you get equal numbers from everyone. But if they never know for sure if you're going to take it up, you should be able to get your homework. But just like today, nobody knew that we weren't going to have a sign-in sheet, so you all showed up. And I didn't see anybody taken off out the door when you found out there wasn't one. So, I mean, it works. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about special ed. Uh, Ron asked me to talk about this this morning. And right now, we're coming up on the second six weeks. Our, our campus policy and district policy is that if a special ed student fails a class for two six weeks in a row, we have a failure ARD. Now, the, the big thing about a failure ARD is you want to be able to walk in there with your documentation of, that you've accomplished their accommodations. So. Make sure, especially for kids, if they're failing your class, that you have documented your accommodations. As you're probably aware, um, special ed, you, you know, you're going to see on some of the accommodation sheets, check for understanding. And I know every one of you says, I'm a good teacher. I check for understanding every lesson every day. But at some point, you need to document that. And you can do it a lot of different ways. I used to put a little uh, check mark in my grade book. That was back in the days when paper was king. Uh, there's other ways to do it, but you need to document that you've checked for understanding. I saw a level three grievance once on a student that was supposed to get positive reinforcement. And the teacher brought some tests as she had graded, handed back, put a smiley face on, and said, good job. That was enough for positive reinforcement, and that was her documentation. So. The big thing you have to realize is if you have a kid that is failing your class, be very sure you've given them their accommodations so that when you sit in that ARD and you need to provide proof that you've done that, you're not just sort of caught flat-footed. So we're giving you a little bit of head start warning on this. I want to talk a little bit about masks and safety. Um, we've had more cases probably in the last two weeks uh, today, we hit our 12th case of students on campus. Uh, the student actually was already on quarantine and caught it from their father, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's 12 cases. We have, that's about 1% of our students have tested positive for COVID. Um, that's a little bit better than, that's better in the county, but the cases are going up in the county. Kids are going to catch this, whether it's here whether it's at home, some kids are going to catch it, without a doubt. It can't be helped. It's an infectious disease. But what we can do is our very best to try to make sure they don't catch it here. Um, uh, we had a couple of kids we had to quarantine because they rode in the car with a girl that was positive, turned out to be positive. I mean, we can't stop that kind of thing. But what we're doing, and this is all we have, really, we insist on the masks, we clean the desks, 
we fog the building nightly. I don't know if y'all have seen the janitors walking around with those Ghostbuster looking packs, but they fog the building with disinfectant nightly. And that's about what we got. I mean, we, there's no cure. I mean, we've got kids packed tightly together. We do the best we can. I have made it my mission in life to keep that one little area outside the library to have their masks on and worn properly. So you will see me out there saying probably about 10 times between each class period, cover your nose, cover your nose, cover your nose. It's not that I don't like to see noses, but I you know, make sure that they're covering all their areas where they could be breathing from. It's gotten to the point now where I just sort of give them a look and or they, as they're walking up, they'll start lifting it because they know I'm going to say something. So they're getting trained, but you have to do your part in your classroom as well. Make sure that they're wearing their masks properly in the classroom. Nobody likes to do this. Make sure your kids understand why. I mean, if you're in close contact, for example, if Miss Ware was ill right now and I'm standing right here, I would not have to go home for quarantine because we have masks on. But if we both had our masks off, I would have to be quarantined. And that's, that's why whenever we get one kid out, a lot of times we'll have seven or eight to get quarantined because that's who they eat lunch with. So make sure it's, it's a pain. It's like you're harping constantly, you're constantly on them, cover your, cover your face, pull your mask up. But that's pretty much the best we got until we have a vaccine or whatever it's gonna to take to get this over with. I mean, it's not gonna last forever. But the more we can keep here, the better. Um, since we've started to have more kids uh, get ill, and since if you look on the, in the Wise County Messenger today, the headline is highest number of cases ever in the county, um, we're going to start having people pull their kids out. You know, they've, they're, they've thought, okay, we'll be fine, we'll send our kids up, and we're starting to see some kids going home now to at-home schooling which is fine, a lot of these kids will do just fine there, but and you, as you and I both know, they do better in the classroom in front of a teacher. That's the optimum environment. And that's gonna happen. The more we can keep it down here, the better. I don't know if people's fears are based on what they see in the paper, but every time we get a case, we send a letter home to the whole high school community, a confirmed case, and people see those, and they get worried, and I understand that. I mean, you know, we've been, I think, fairly blessed so far. But, you know, I mean, it might just be we're hitting a bad patch and then in a couple of weeks it'll be good again. But we had three kids that got it all together and among, between those three kids, we quarantined about over 20, about 25 or so. So, I mean, that can, it doesn't take a whole lot to make the numbers get really big really quick. But as far as cases, actual live cases, as of yesterday when I went through my spreadsheet and counted, we've had 11 and quite a few of them, we don't know where that, that, as far as kids we've sent home that caught COVID, we've had, that home for a quarantine, we've had one, and they caught it from dad. So, I mean, it's, something's going all right. Um, Ms. Erickson, okay. you ready? Yes. All right. Any of you who have students taking the SAT or ACT, um, I'm lying, not the SAT or the ACT, any of you who have students taking the Telpass, this will help them on a lot of things that you are having them test with. We have supplemental aids. If you've sat in an ARD, you know that certain students get that ability to have a blank graphic organizer with them while they're taking their English test, or there's like a little sheet that they can use while they're taking their math test. Okay, that actually, that thing is called supplemental aids, that category. And it's actually a lot bigger than I realized. There's a lot of things that your kids can be using on those tests to score better. The trick of it is, in order for them to score well on that test, in, in order for them to use that supplemental aid on that test, they have to be using it in your classroom routinely and effectively, okay? So that means if you see something up here from what I'm about to show you, and I tried to email it to everybody, hopefully that happened, if you see something up here that you want to use in your classroom, start giving it to those students who need it routinely and pay attention, document whether or not it is affecting their ability to score well. And if that works for those students, then it is something that you can ask to them for them to be able to use on their end of course exams. 
and also something that they can use on their telpass. And I think, Ms. Schistler, was there, were there one or two other tests that they can use it on as well? Okay, I'll, I'll check into that for you. But all of our students can, can benefit from having these supplemental aids being used in the classroom. And then you know that if you're using it in the classroom, they can take it to school with them. They can take it to the testing with them. Okay, I don't know what's going on, what I'm not doing right. Is that what I didn't do right? Okay, so it's in an email, and the email is titled Supplemental Aids. It's exactly what I'm about to show you, and I'm just going to point out one or two things, and then we'll be good. Is it on mute? Are we on mute? No, we're just not coming. Ah, there we are. Okay, so this is a quick start. It came from Lead Forward, and it's got everybody's subject matters mashed together. So when you look at it, look for your subject matter. It may be a little square or a big square. But it's basically this. For example, you need this a lot clearer. Plus, plus, plus. Okay, scoot over, scoot down. Okay, so here's an example of mnemonic devices, what you can give kids on a test. They can actually carry into the test with them acronyms or phrases based on an acronym. What you cannot do is fill it in for them with the rest of the information. So you can give them PEMDAS, or PEMDAS, however y'all say that. You cannot spell it out for them, parentheses, exponents, etc. They have to be able to turn PEMDAS into the other thing themselves. Okay? Um, for math, you can give them this empty, the empty fraction pi thing. You cannot give it to them filled in with the numbers underneath. Okay, uh, over here, let's see, more math. Let's try some science. Okay, let's go down to the next one. Okay, so for social studies, you cannot give them a labeled map. You can give them an empty map. If this is something that is routinely and effectively helping them in class and you think it will routinely and effectively help them on their star, and of course, you can do that. Okay, I'm going to show you one other thing. This was what made it exciting for us English teachers. So examples of science graphics, they're all in here. One other thing is this. For our ELs. You can't see it very well. OK. Um, this is a list of grammar rules. We're actually allowed to give them a list of grammar rules that they can walk into the test with. As long as I am routinely giving them this list every time they take a test or do assignments in my class, the list is in Spanish. It tells them when to use periods, when to use commas, when to use colons, when to use capital letters. As long as I'm not giving them a specific example, I can tell them use a comma to separate city from state. I cannot tell them Decatur, comma, Texas. All right? So as long as you're giving them the rule to follow, like a math chart of formulas, but you're not giving them specific examples to make it more clear for them, you can use these things for them. If you document that it's routine and effective, they can use it on their, on their formalized, standardized tests. Okay? Uh, like I said, I emailed most of this to you. Hit me with your questions. It's especially beneficial for your ESL population. But if you have SPED kids and 504 kids, definitely use this. If you have a kid that is none of the above, not SPED, not 504, not ESL, but they are one of your troubled kids and you are kind of doing an RTI approach with them, response to intervention approach with them. If you want to try using this with, on the kid in your classroom, there is potential for them to use it on their end of course testing. Okay, thank you everybody. One of the things, keep in mind, and some of y'all do a lot of ARDS. Ms. Reynolds, I, it, you're like the designated ARD person, it seems like. I don't know how that worked out, I guess because you're new. Um, but some of y'all do a lot of ARDS. And I also realize some of you get these accommodation sheets, and they are lots and lots of accommodations. I mean, 20 accommodations. I mean, and, I'm, you know, guys, I taught. I mean... I know when you look at that, the first thing you think is there's no way I can get all this done and document it. Um, one of the things I urge you to do when you're in an ARD is to um, 
represent your fellow teachers. I mean, if you see an accommodation, you know that kid, you've got that kid in class typically. If you see an accommodation on there that you don't feel like is useful, bring that up and tell the committee, you know, I don't think this child needs that. We had one the other day where we had a kid that had all A's and B's and when we were going through the teacher recommendations, the kid had like three accommodations and they were very minor. We are going through the teacher recommendations, they asked, they recommended another accommodation. If the kid's making an A or B in your class, they don't need any more accommodations. I mean, they're doing fine. We don't want to accommodate kids more if they're doing fine already. If they don't need it. It's not least restrictive environment and you're just adding to your load. So keep in mind, I mean, Ideally, we would have three or four accommodations per kid, and that's going to take a lot of whittling for some. Some will need more, without a doubt. Some will need more. But we have so many accommodations sometimes that I don't think it's really very feasible for you to accomplish all them. What that means is when we, I mean, it's hard for me sitting in an R to say, I don't think that kid needs that because I've not actually seen that kid. Now, I, I'm always fighting against the ones like check for understanding, but things that you normally do anyway. I mean, a good teacher's going to check for understanding throughout the lesson. And again, it's, it's not a big deal to do. It's very hard to document. It's a pain. So keep in mind, as you sit in ARDS, make sure we're giving that kid what they need, but not too much. I mean, we want to make it just as challenging as it would for other kids while still giving them something they can accomplish. All right, I wanted to, uh, well, I want to go, I'm not going to go over the whole campus golf sheet. I sent this out to you this morning, and this is from our campus improvement plan. I didn't used to need these. Now I do. And now that I'm going to fog up, I'm sure. But I wanted to go over goals, performance, objectives, strategies. And a goal is a large overarching type of something that we want to do. Uh, our first goal, and this is the one that we'll deal, most teachers will deal with, DHS will engage students equally in rigorous and relevant curriculum, instruction, and assessment that will prepare them for graduation and post-secondary opportunities. As Ms. Ware asked at our last meeting, how is that measurable? Well, this particular, the goal itself does not have a measurement attached. So let's go to the performance objectives, excuse me, the strategies, or the performance objectives and the strategies. Our performance objective, and this is what the committee deliberated about, and there was a little trepidation on this. All star tested subjects will achieve scores at least five points above state average measured by the standard of approaches, meets, and masters. So typically you write these goals based on we're going to get this much better from last year. We don't have a last year. We just have two years ago, and that's not very relevant because kids that took English one two years ago are not taking English at all now. So what we've decided was let's measure ourselves against the rest of the state. State average, I think this is an above average school. I think this is above average staff. And we've been hitting, last time, between one and three points of state average, either above or below. So our goal is going to be let's get five points above state average across the board. And then we have some strategies, and I'm not going to go over all those. Goal number, or performance objective number two. One of the things, and I think most of y'all will, I mean, you, you know this, a lot of our economically disadvantaged students do not take advantage of getting college credit in high school, whether by AP or dual credit. Maybe AP because they're not that traditional student that thinks they can get a three, four, or five, or in dual credit possibly because either they haven't been tutored to pass the TSI or they just don't have the money. So we're going to concentrate on trying to help some of those kids get into dual credit courses so that maybe when they walk out of here, they'll have 12 hours or 15 hours or 24 hours. 
and have that much of a leg up on completing a degree. The hope here is if they start it here, maybe they'll carry it on. So, and if they've already passed the TSI here, then they can go on to a junior college without having to take any more testing. And I don't want to go over goal two and three unless you have any questions about them, but I wanted to share, those are the goals that concern teachers the most. We have some CTE goals as well, but uh, they're more, almost more on the admin side than they are on the teaching side. Any questions on those goals or performance objectives? Okay. I can take the glasses off. It seems to me, Mr. Van pretty much every day sits in detention. He's not assigned, he proctors. And has maybe one or two kids in there. And from a school of this size, that's, I'm a little surprised. I mean, hey, it might just be we're, all that, we're that good. But I'm not sure everybody here understands the detention process. So I want to go over it. First of all, this is a detention slip. And you can get them from Dawn in the second floor office. You can assign a student one or two hours of detention. And you don't have to sit in that detention with them. Mr. Van is doing that. So if you have a student that you feel like needs some kind of disciplinary action, but you don't think it's bad enough to send them to the office, you can assign them detention. Let me tell you how it works. Obviously, student's name, teacher's name, what they did. We're not going to double guess or second guess you on this. As a matter of fact, Unless the kid skips detention, no administrator will ever see this. This is your detention. I'm just paying his salary to do it, or there's some other people too, but mainly him. Today's day and date, day and date by which the detention must be served. This is where I started this about 12 years ago and on another campus, and one of the things that I wasn't fond of was the fact that sometimes a teacher would assign a kid a detention on Tuesday and that kid might not be able to go to a basketball game. That means that kid's getting a whole lot more than an hour of detention. That kid's missing a basketball game as well, which is a big, big punishment. And these are high school kids, so basically we said, we'll give you five days to complete this detention. The kid is responsible. So in other words, let's say a kid, we have a detention Monday through Thursday. So it's a little, maybe a little complicated. You, if you use it, you'll get used to it. Your kid gets a detention on Monday. You put this in the box. There's a Monday. So is, that, is that how we're doing it? They're just giving them to you. I, I just look online. Okay, we're doing it online. Okay, well, Dawn's handling this then. Well, good for her. I mean, that's, that's easier probably. Okay, so if you put the date, today's day and date, then you put the date that it has to be served by. And the detention teacher will check through these. When a kid expires, then they say, did not serve, hand it to an assistant principal, and that kid will go to ISS for not serving their detention. But we're giving them five days, and they do have to be a little bit responsible. We're saying, you're high school kids. We're not going to take away some evening activity from you, but after five days, we're not going to extend it unless you were out sick the whole time or something like that, you're going to go to ISS. You have five days. Now, we are working towards starting to notify those kids on the fifth day, and we pro I want to get to the point where we're going to go get them at the end of the day and say, you're coming to detention today. We're not quite there yet. It's, it's a work in progress, but we don't have too many kids doing this. You put one or two. If they need three, that's a referral. Send them to the office. I mean, three's a lot. What day, lecture hall, second floor, tells the times, student signature. All right, when I first started this, I would get these detention slips, and the students didn't even know about it. We, don't, we can't give ghost detentions, okay? The student has to know. They have to know, make sure they understand, and I would say write it on a sticky or whatever. This is when you have to have your detention served by. The student has to know that. If the student doesn't, I mean, we can't just wait till they're gone and write them up. You know, I mean, that's not fair. Um, it will, you, some, sometimes you just have to look a student in the eye and say, you're getting an attention. And that's okay. Now, the only time we don't stick a kid in ISS if they skip their detention 
is for homework. If you want to assign a kid for homework, that's okay. But if they don't serve their detention, you just give them a zero. Okay, that's, I mean, we can't, we've had some days where we'd have had 30, 40 kids in ISS. We can't do that. I mean, I don't want them missing that much instruction. Right now, the usage is light. Other campuses I've worked on of this size, we would have 10 to 15 a day. So it's very light. You have maybe, what's your average? Well, one day I didn't have any. Okay. Uh, about four, I would imagine. Mr. Van needs you to assign somebody so he can make his money. I mean, we don't pay him if he doesn't have anybody.